Good morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, this morning's speakers. Um, Avram Blum is someone I've known since in graduate school, taught it uh, as, well as an undergraduate, and file, followed with admiration his remarkable career um, with amazement. Um, Avram Blum is the chief academic officer at the Toyota Technol Technological Institute at Chicago. He is the past director of the NSF-funded multi-institution and transdisciplinary institute for data econ economic, econometrics, algorithms, and learning, IDEAL. His main research interests are in theoretical computer science and machine learning, including machine learning theory, approximation algorithms, algorithmic game theory, privacy, and algorithmic fairness. His interest in learning and repeated games goes back to the early days of computer scientists working on game theory. He was the first to suggest no regret learning or learning satisfying the Hannon consistency criteria as the, a behavioral assumption in repeated games and wondered what we can say about the efficiency loss at the, of the outcome under this assumption. Before joining the Toyota Technological Institute at Chicago, he served on the faculty in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon University for 25 years. His PhD and all other degrees are from MIT. His work has been honored by the AI Journal Classic Paper Award, the ICML Cult 10 Year Best Paper Award, the Sloan Fellowship, the NSF Young Investigator Award. He's a fellow of the of the ACM. He was program chair for two of the foremost theoretical computer science conferences, Fox and ITCS, the main conference on learning theory, Colt. He has served as the chair of the ACM SIGAC Committee for the Advancement of Theoretical Computer Science and on the SIGAC Executive Committee. Today, Avram is talking to us about on learning and the presence of bias, data, and strategic behavior. Please welcome Avram Blum. Thank you for the, the kind introduction. I, um, yeah, I, I first met David as an undergraduate, and he, was, he taught this amazing class, and, and uh, uh, it was really great. Um, so yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, learning in the presence of biased data and strategic behavior. Uh, and uh, actually, before I do that, let me just, you might be wondering, what is this TTIC? So uh, just like with the YouTube video where you first have to see an advertisement, here we go. Uh, so what is TTIC? Uh, so we are a computer science graduate institute. We are uh, affiliated with the University of Chicago and supported in part by an endowment uh, provided to us by Toyota and TTI Japan. Uh, okay, so what does that mean? Uh, well, we have uh, 12 tenure track faculty and plus or minus 12 uh, research assistant professors um, uh, working on research in, in machine learning, uh, algorithms theory, computer vision, speech, NLP, robotics, computational biology. We have a PhD program with about 40 PhD students working on these topics with our faculty. We're very much like a department at the University of Chicago. Um, and we have a lot of activities, workshops, summer interns, colloquial reading groups. So uh, stop by for a visit. Okay. On to the talk. So, <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about two things most of the time on the first one and then a little bit on the second. First, on, on fairness and biased data. And uh, just to give a, a kind of a one slide version of, of this part of the talk. Uh, so, usually in discussions of fairness in machine learning, uh, we tend to think of a trade off between fairness and accuracy or between different fairness notions themselves. Uh, but what if the training data that we're training our classifier on is biased? Uh, could the fairness constraints that we, uh, ver could various fairness constraints actually lead to improved performance even if, as a decision maker, the only thing we care about is accuracy? So a little bit like the following. So generally, constrained optimization will only lead to worse solutions than unconstrained optimization, right? But, uh, but what if our objective function is faulty? Then maybe these constraints could actually help guide us in the right direction. Okay, this is, this is what we'll see. So what we're gonna do is we'll posit some simple bias scenarios, and then we'll examine whether existing fairness notions could help correct for them, or maybe they might hurt, um, and we'll see. Okay, so fairness. Um, okay, so, so the setting here is you know, algorithms are increasingly being used to automate or advise decisions that impact people. Uh, for instance, so things to think about, uh, whether to be approved for a loan, um, whether someone should be admitted to college, uh, whether uh, someone should be hired for a job, uh, bail and parole decisions. And it's well you know, understood that it would be a big problem if these algorithms were systematically biased against some racial, ethnic, or gender group. Okay, so 
What do we mean by fairness? Well, fairness can mean a lot of different things. So let's instead ask a different question, which is what are some things that we might want? All right. So think about, again, like, say, uh, a classifier that's going to be used to decide uh, you know, or advise uh, uh, who gets uh, admitted to a college, who gets approved for a loan. So think of situations like that. So, so what are some things we might want? So here's one notion that's in the literature called equality of opportunity. So we'll say that a classifier, so I'll use predictor or classifier. Uh, uh, these are all binary classifications, so I'll, I'll, I'll use them interchangeably. So predictor uh, satisfies equality of opportunity with respect to a set of groups. So think of, you know, say, men and women. Uh, if the probability it predicts positive, given that you're actually positive, is about the same across the groups. So if you really would do well, the chance that, uh, so if you, know, if you really would be a good student, a good employee, a good borrower, the you should have the same chance of getting admitted or hired or approved for the loan, regardless of whether you're in group A or group B. Okay, that's this notion. All right. Another notion uh, called equalized odds says we want that and also on the negative side. If you would not be good, then you should also have the same chance of being admitted, regardless of your group. Okay, so it's, equ it's equality of opportunity plus the same on the negative side. Okay. Um, and there's a, a notion called calibration, which in the context of a binary classifier looks a lot like equalized odds, but reversing the order of the arguments. So we'll say a predictor is a binary classifier is calibrated with respect to a set of groups if the probability you're a, a true positive, given that it says you're positive, if those are about the same, regardless of your group, and, and the same on the, on the negative side. So of the students you admit, the fraction who do well should be about the same across the groups. And of the students you don't admit, the fraction who would have done well, if you can get that information, should also be about the same across the groups. So that's calibration in the context of a binary classifier. So one way people think about this is kind of the meaning of predicting positive or predicting negative. That should be about the same across the groups. And one more notion, uh, demographic parity. This says that uh, the probability you predict positive should be about the same across the group. So you know, if you um, admit 10% of the applicants from group A, you should also admit about 10% of the applicants from group B. OK, so these are a bunch of notions. They all seem reasonable. Um, many of them can be in conflict with each other. And there's been a lot of really interesting work, including by folks here, uh, showing how they can very strongly be in conflict with each other. Uh, in, in, in a lot of settings. OK. Um, but what we're going to look at is not the question of which you know, one is better. We're just going to, in, in some sort of moral sense, uh, we're going to be interested in, in what can they do with respect to bias training data. So, so a commonly cited reason for bias in classifiers is the notion that you know, often the training data can be biased, and then this gets kind of baked in to the classifier that you learn. Um, and so right, instead of trying to argue which fairness notion is kind of right, um, let's just consider some natural ways that data could be biased, and then see uh, you know, what happens if we impose one of these constraints. Uh, maybe some of them could actually improve the accuracy of the classifier produced. Maybe some of them might make it worse. But if it improves the accuracy, then maybe that would give some additional motivation for using that fairness criteria um, separate from kind of the, the, the moral fairness issue. OK, so one caveat, <laughs> we're going to be making a, a number of assumptions, uh, some re realistic and some a little less so, uh, on both the bias model, how data is getting biased, and on the ground truth, the true function we're trying to learn. Um, and different assumptions could lead to different conclusions. OK, so I feel like I'm selling stock or something. OK, anyway, <laughs> right. Um, OK, so here's the setting. So we're going to consider two groups, uh, A and B. Think of A as the advantage group, and B as the disadvantage group. Uh, OK, and um, so here they are. Um, 
Now, the groups are disjoint. Uh, membership is observable. You can tell what group someone belongs to. We're looking at a binary classification task, um, you know, someone, whether someone should be approved for a loan or not, uh, uh, hired or not, admitted or not, something like that. Uh, I'm going to draw little cartoon pictures like this one here. The, the way to read that is the, the, the blue nodes are the, 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 pos the true positives, the ones who really would do well. The green nodes are the true negatives, the ones who really would not do well. Uh, the red line here is our classifier, which is not perfect, but maybe is the best we can do given the feature information we have. I mean, all we see is where they live in some feature space, and this is kind of we're doing the best we can there, and we're making a few mistakes, but doing pretty well. Okay, that's the, the way to think about that cartoon picture. Um, well, imagine there's some true distribution on, on uh, X, Y pairs. X is the example, Y is the label um, for people in group A, and another distribution on people in group B. They aren't identical. Um, uh, they're, they're different, and maybe the right thing you should do for each group might be different. So it might be that group A kind of looks like that, and for them you want a classifier that kind of looks like that, and group B looks this way, and maybe the, the best classifier for them looks a little bit different. Um, you could imagine they're living in somewhat different parts of the space, so this could really be the same classifier, but just kind of doing different things in different parts of the space. The overall distribution is a mixture. Um, you know, random person with some probability R belongs to group B and some remaining probability belongs to group A. Oh, I'm gonna have like various notation, different parts. You don't have to remember any of it. I'm just using it just to try to be clear. Uh, we'll generally think of, of group B as like a, as a minority group R being less than or equal to a half, but it doesn't really matter for, but, but think of it, think of it as, as being a smaller group than group A. Okay. And then we're going to think of an algorithm that, what does it do? It performs e empirical risk minimization on a, a training sample. So what do I mean by that? It takes a sample of data and just tries to find the best classifier it can, the lowest error it can, uh, possibly subject to fairness constraints. And we'll be looking at this in the large sample limit. So often in, in learning theory, there's a big question of overfitting and issues like that. I'm going to ignore those issues. Imagine we have enough data, lots of data, and the limit as data gets large. But it's still going to be biased, because I want to focus on the effect of the bias rather than the effect of small sample issues. Okay, that, I think looking at this in, a, in, a, in the finite sample case is also interesting as well, as you'll see from some of the bias models. But, but we're explicitly not looking at that. Okay. So that's the high level setting. All right. So now let me tell you, I'm going to look at two and a half bias models. So let me just describe the models of, of bias I'm, I'm going to be thinking about. OK, so here's one. The first one um, is an, an underrepresentation bias. So, so what is this? We're going to imagine that group B shows up less in your training data than it ought to, than in the true population that you care about, and at this rate may differ for positives and negatives. So imagine that your company has not hired very, very many people from group B, and so group B people might have been less likely to apply, and moreover, the well-qualified people in group B might be even less likely to apply because they have more outside options. Okay, So it could look in your training data, your training data might look like there are fewer you know, group B might look less qualified because the qualified people in group B just didn't apply as much. And that could lead to some bias. Okay, so, so maybe, you know, some of these qualified people, whoops, didn't show up. And so now, you know, group B looks greener than group A. It looks less qualified on average because qualified people just chose not to apply and, and, and it's not, they're not, in your training data. So that's one kind of bias model. So, so formally, you could model something like this. You draw a random, what does your training data look like? Draw a random example from the underlying distribution. If they're a member of group A, they're in. If they're a member of group B and they're positive, you only keep them with some probability beta plus. If they're negative, keep them with some probability beta minus, and they could be different. And the interesting case will be when beta plus is smaller than beta minus, so the positives are, show up less, less, uh, frequently in group B looks more negative than it should. Okay, that's one bias model. Uh, another way training data could be biased is what we'll call labeling bias, is everyone shows up, but how are the labels determined on your training data? Maybe by, you know, people uh, looking at them and deciding, hmm, do they seem qualified or not? And maybe they themselves are biased. And so some positives of group B were mislabeled as negative in your training data, all right? So maybe some of them were mislabeled as negative in your training data. Um, and so formally the model we'll look at here is 
how's your training data produced? You draw random examples from this underlying distribution, and if they're in A, great, they're in uh, with the true label. If they're in B and their label's positive, with some probability nu, so think of nu as you know, 10%, say, their label was flipped negative. And so again, group B is looking more negative because the training data was labeled by some biased labelers. Okay, and then if we want to get fancy, we could imagine both of these together. All right, all right. so, th so those are the kind of bias we'll be interested in. And I, and I would say those are pretty reasonable notions of bias. You could think of certainly many others, but I think, you know, why not? Those are pretty reasonable, Let, let's study those. Now I'm gonna go on to make some assumptions about the ground truth. These are gonna be a little less reasonable, all right? But, but before getting to them, let, let me just some, some guiding principles. Uh, so first of all, um, it, this will be most interesting in a world where there is no perfect classifier. If there was a perfect decision boundary, then the underrepresentation bias wouldn't be such a big deal. We're looking in the large sample limit. Sure, we see fewer positives, but eventually we'll see enough that we learn a good decision boundary. It's going to be most interesting when there's no perfect classifier, and so our algorithm is going to have to make some mistakes in how it's treating them off. So that's number one. And number two, I want to set things up so that the Bayes optimal classifier satisfies all the fairness conditions on the true unbiased distribution. If, if we don't have that, then we're gonna, that'll create an intrinsic conflict from the very beginning. And so I want to look at a situation where all these fairness notions make sense when you are looking at um, unbiased data. Okay, so with that, let me specifically talk about the model here. And there's been, there's been subsequent work that's reduced some of, you know, uh, relaxed some of these assumptions, but, but let me just give our, our, our basic model. So here's the model. We're gonna assume that there exists two Bayes optimal classifiers, HA star and HB star, and these are these red lines here. HA star, HB star. Okay, with the property that for all examples, um, the, the, the label, the, the true label of that example, is equal to what the classifier is saying, so positive above the line, negative below the line, it's equal to their label with some probability one minus eta. Think of eta as a quarter. So it's probably three quarters, it's the right, they, they actually have that label. With probability uh, one quarter, they actually have the opposite label. So, so this eta, less than a half, is, is think of it as a quarter again, is the intrinsic error rate of these Bayes optimal classifiers. So this assumption is saying these classifiers have an intrinsic error rate, a quarter, and moreover, those errors are, are uniformly distributed among the examples. It's not like they all cluster in one part of the space or another, okay? That they're, the errors that the Bayes optimal classifier makes are, are in uniformly distributed uh, across the examples. Um, that, that also ensures that these really are the Bayes optimal classifiers. Okay, so that's, that's number one. And the second thing is we're gonna assume that for both groups, the probability a random example is above the line that, the cla that this classifier says positive is the same, is some value p, okay? So both groups have probability mass p above the line and one minus p below the line. So this assumption is saying that these Bayes optimal classifiers satisfy demographic parity. These classify a probability fraction p of both each group as, as positive. Okay, so Bayes optimal classifiers satisfy demographic parity. These assumptions actually do imply these are the Bayes optimal classifiers. They imply the Bayes optimal classifiers are calibrated. So um, given that you are uh, above, um, uh, yeah, given that you're above the line, the probability that you're blue is one minus eta, 75% for both groups. Given that you're below the line, the probability that you're uh, green is also 75%, it's true for, for both groups. And by Bayes' rule, they satisfy uh, equality of opportunity and equalized odds. So, the, so calibration said, uh, what's the probability you're blue given you're above the line? Uh, equality of opportunity says, what's the probability you're above the line given that you're blue? And that's you know the probability you're blue given you're above the line times the probability you're, uh, you're above the line divided by the probability you're blue, right? So, and so that's the same. So, so we're starting things off before the bias, all those properties are satisfied. Now we're gonna start adding in the bias and let's see what happens. Good. Okay, so let's think of underrepresentation bias. Let's think of uh, all the negatives in group B show up, the positives we start as we, reduce beta plus from one down to zero, think of positives disappearing in group B and seeing what happens. Like what happens to, what would our learning algorithm do if we start crossing off random positive examples 
from you know, group B. Okay, so we start crossing off random positive examples in group B. And so what's going to happen is just empirical risk minimization, just minimizing training error, is actually it's going to do the right thing for a while until the, uh, that beta plus gets so small, so let's just keep going, crossing off, you know, random positive examples here, until above the line there are now more negatives than positives. And at that point, the base optimal, the, the, the ERM, what it's going to do is just classify all of group B as negative. It, because we just deleted random positive points, once the area above is, is uh, more negative than positive, and because of our assumption about where the errors are, that they're all uniformly distributed, the best thing you can do as a minimizing, ac minimizing error, maximizing accuracy, is just to label all of group B as negative. So it'll do the right thing until, until that bias gets so strong they'll just label everybody in group B as negative. Okay, that's what ERM by itself is going to do. Okay, now let's add a fairness constraint and see what happens. What happens if we force our classifier to be calibrated? So let's again imagine that we started deleting some of our positive examples here. And let's see what happens. So calibration is going to do something uh, a little unfortunate. So even before we get to the place where ERM would switch, so ERM right at this point is doing the right thing. On, on, on the unconstrained ERM. But now we force it to be calibrated. So what does that mean? Being calibrated means that the greenness of the area below the line should be the same, and the blueness of the area above the line should be the same. And right now, below the line is greener here than there because we deleted some blue points. And the only way to fix that, since you can't make that area any greener, is to make this area bluer by raising this red line, raising the classifier and classifying some of the negative region um, uh, of, 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 sorry, some of the positive region for B classify, misclassifying it as negative. Also above the line, it's bluer on the A side than the B side, and the only way to fix that, since we can't make this any bluer, is to make that greener, and so that what calibration would do is force us to lower this. So calibration will force us to kind of bake this bias into the classifier, uh, for instance, admitting fewer people from group B and more people from group A to make it calibrated, um, which is kind of A, unfair, and, but B, more importantly for us, uh, worsens accuracy. Okay, so it actually makes things worse. Uh, now demographic parity, what does that do? So demographic parity, as we throw out random positives, well, Random positives, most of them are above the line. So it used to be a P fraction of the points are above the line, but now a smaller than P fraction are above the line for B because we threw out a higher fraction above than below. And so demographic parity would require us to, to lower this uh, class of the line here to increase that. So it would be helpful for group B, but it reduces accuracy. So from our perspective, you know, demographic parity is, is problematic here because it's going to reduce accuracy. On the other hand, equality of opportunity and equalized odds are interesting because uh, they allow the base optimal classifiers to go through. The, the things that they care about haven't changed, and that's because in this bias model, the probability someone shows up is a function of their true label, not where they're living in feature space. So if you throw out, we throw out these random positives, it's true that the probability you're positive given you're above the line, that's changed. But the probability you're above the line given that you're positive, that stayed the same. And so these are gonna, gonna allow, allow those classifiers to go through. And even more, okay, because that would be, you know, plain old ERM would do that also. But even more what they'll do is they will, what'll happen is that um, these will be the unique optimal uh, classifier satisfying this condition for all values of beta plus greater than zero. So even if, if beta plus is so small, so we, we've thrown out so many points that uh, without any constraints, ERM would like to label all of group B as negative. It can't do that because in order to label all of group B as negative and satisfy EO, it'll have to label all of group A as negative also. Okay, and, and because it doesn't want to do that, because it's trying to minimize empirical error, the fact that it wants to do well on group A is going to force it to still do something reasonable on group B. And it'll actually lock in those 
classifiers, the HA star and HB star, uh, until you get to the point either where there are no uh, positives at all in B, or if you set your parameters so that it just wants to make everybody in the whole world negative, okay? But basically what this will do is use the fact that it wants to do well on group A to force it to also do the right thing on group B. So this will actually kind of link them together and force it to do the right thing. Okay. What about labeling bias? So labeling bias was points weren't deleted, they just got mislabeled, or just <laughs> got mislabeled. And you know, you can see what's gonna happen as, as points get mislabeled, so random blues get mislabeled as green. At some point, we're, now we have six greens and six blues above the line. You know, one slightly more noise, and all of a sudden we're gonna wanna label all of group B as negative again. So ERM by itself, it'll do the right thing uh, until you get enough noise, it'll just wanna label all of group B as negative. Okay, so, um, uh, and now equality of opportunity will continue to lock in the, the Bayes optimal classifiers. Actually, in this case, demographic parity will also. So even if the noise gets so strong, the ERM without the, um, without the constraint would want to label all of group B as negative, it can't do that because it's trying to uh, equalize a quantity on group A and group B, and so it'll force it to do the right thing on group B. Um, Unfortunately, equalized odds, the one that cares about the negative side, that no longer works. At that, it, the, the statistic it's looking at has changed, and so that will force it to do some crazy things and, and move away from the base optimal classifiers. So equality of opportunity, the one that just cares about the probability you're admitted given that you're qualified, that one works. But equalized odds, the one that also says the probability you're admitted given you're not qualified, that one is causing problems here. Um, and calibration will continue to force the classifier to favor group A and hurt group B to match the things it's looking at. And if you put both together, uh, equality of opportunity will actually continue to lock in uh, HA star and HB star until the bias is so overwhelming that ERM would just want to label the entire everybody as negative. Okay, so, so the takeaway message from, from this part uh, is that uh, fairness conditions can have uh, interesting and different impacts on accuracy when your training data is biased. Uh, in these models that we looked at, the equality of opportunity notion is particularly helpful under these kinds of bias, where the bias depended on, on, on just the true labels of the points and not where they lived in space. Um, it was particularly helpful in so forcing the classifier to use its desire to do well in group A to force it to also, you know, uh, not get misled by the bias on group B, whereas each of the other notions has, has one, one or other problems. Um, and, 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 and these notions, calibration is kind of particularly problematic in that it's forcing you to take the bias and, and even more bake it into the, the classifier that you learn. But again, this is a, these are particular models, and under different, you know, if you set up a bias model differently, you might have, have different, uh, different particular conclusions. But the main point is that these fairness conditions can potentially help um, and, and, and certainly can affect uh, uh, the classifier that you learn. Okay, so that's the first part. Okay, good. So, so now I want to uh, turn to um, uh, something completely different. <laughs> so um, I want to think now, because the second part, I want to talk about, um, it'll be similar kind of situations. We'll, we can again think of people applying for the loan, but this is going to be a more game theoretic setup now. Okay, and now we're going to be thinking of ourselves as a decision maker, uh, concerned about um, uh, people coming in and trying to game the system in order to get what they want. Okay, so this is going to be a more, more of a game theoretic uh, 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 type of, of, of consideration. Okay. So, okay, so, so now I want to look at so kind of a different kind of bias. So we are going to be classifying entities, say, who want to get a loan or admit, admitted, to, admitted and so forth. Um, and, and the entities are, are, the agents are going to uh, modify how they appear in order to be labeled positive. So we're going to have a model here where agents can modify their feature values at some cost. Okay, they can do things that move where they look like they live in feature space uh, because they want to get classified as positive. Okay. And the challenge for us is that we are going to be a learning algorithm seeing data arriving. And, but the data is always, we never see clean data. We always see data that's reacting to the classifier we're using. So we have some way of deciding who gets the loan. 
We're going to assume people know what that is, and they're going to react to it, doing various things to try to get that. We're going to see we make some mistakes. We're going to modify what we do. Agents are going to modify how they respond to us, okay, so that we're going to, we never get to see clean data. You know, it's always in reaction to whatever classifier we're using. Okay, that's, that's going to be the challenge. And we're going to look at this in an online learning setting where it's particularly a challenge. As I said, we're not going to have a, we can't have like a phase where we just gather a focus group or something like that. It's always going to be agents reacting to what we're doing. Okay. That's right. So, so you, uh, you could think of this online learning of a Stackelberg leader strategy if that, that means something to you. Okay. So, so um, this kind of thing is sometimes called measure management. Um, uh, I just wanted to highlight this nice book from Cornell, uh, um, which uh, I like. Um, and it's called What Counts and What Gets Counted. And it's talking about specifically this difference between what you care about, what counts. You know, you're trying in, this, in the, the context of this book, it's talking about how do you um, uh, incentivize, you know, employees or, you know, branch managers or the bank or whatever it is. Um, and how you, so what you care about is, is uh, you know, whether they're, they're really doing well, but you have to measure them somehow, and the, what gets counted is what you're measuring, and the point is that the way you measure is gonna affect what they do, and so, you know, there's a difference between these things. Okay, so here's the model. Um, we're gonna think, again, of binary classification. Points are gonna be uh, uh, in RD, um, and the, we're going to assume the true data actually is linearly separable. So now the blues and greens are perfectly separable, and this red line really is a linear separator. Before it was just a decision boundary. Uh, we're going to imagine agent data points, they arrive one at a time. Uh, classifier will make a decision, positive or negative. It doesn't see their label, it just sees the point. It's got to decide, positive or negative. Uh, and then afterwards, it finds out the correct answer, and maybe it made a mistake, maybe it didn't, and it's trying to minimize how many mistakes it makes. Agents have the ability to manipulate, to move in this space, uh, some limited amount. We can think of a, the simplest case is they can move in an L2 ball of some radius. You can also look at L1 uh, uh, measures where they think of that as their different features that they can change at some cost. Uh, but let's just think of L2. And they want to be classified as positive, okay? So, so for instance, this green point could move, say, within that yellow ball, and um, uh, so it's, it has the ability to, to move in that and it wants to be classified positive. Uh, we'll think of agents getting a benefit of one from a positive classification, zero from negative classification. They have costs to move, they're, they're linear in how far they move, and they're utility maximizers. So what would this green point do? It's a utility maximizer. It would move here. That's the cheapest way it can move to get itself classified as positive. It costs less than one, it's getting a benefit of one, it'll do that. Okay, that's gonna be our assumption on the agents. Agents know the current classification rule, so they know which way to go. Um, and if the classification rule is deterministic, which it will be in everything I say, uh, agents will only manipulate if it changes their classification. If, okay, if, if, if it wouldn't make an effect, there's, why do it? And, um, and if they can do it, they'll do it in the cheapest way possible. All right. Let me just give an example of what a challenge is in this setting. So imagine two-dimensional data here living on the, on the uh, screen. Um, this is linearly separable data. Imagine agents can manipulate in an L2 ball of radius 0.5. Okay, and let's think of a, a standard online learning algorithm which we'll be looking at called the perceptron algorithm. How does that algorithm work? Well, it waits, it classifies things as negative until it sees its first example. It's the first, po uh, um, let's see, so let's say the first example it sees is this one here, it's positive, and it will set its initial weight vector to, to equal that example. Um, so the green vector is, is the, the classification vector. Uh, w dot x greater or equal to zero is are you to the right of the purple line or to the left of the purple line? Okay, so the decision boundary is that purple line. Uh, everything greater than equal to that is classifying positive. Everything less than that is classifying negative. Actually, it looks quite good. But remember, agents can manipulate. So the second example that arrives is that negative example, but it doesn't show up there. It sees the purple line. It can move a distance of 0.5, so it will. It'll move there and get itself classified as positive. Okay, great for that agent. It got, classified. It got the loan. The classifier says, dang it, I gave a loan to someone I shouldn't have. It takes that, it's, it doesn't see where it came from, it just sees where it ended up. And so it will subtract that from its current vector. It sees a point at zero, 01 labeled negative. Oops, I misclassified it. It will subtract that to create the new vector one minus one and the new decision boundary there. That's what 
the algorithm will do. And then the next example that shows up is this one here, this positive. And that example, gosh, it would like to move, but it's too far. It's root two over two away from this decision boundary, and it can only move distance a half. So it won't move at all. Uh, it'll just stay there. And the classifier will now say, oops, I made a mistake at a positive example at location 0, 1. Let me add that to my vector. It'll get back to here. And if these two examples come back and forth, you know, alternating, we'll keep making mistakes, going back and forth, back and forth, infinitely many mistakes, when in hindsight, there, you know, there really was actually a good classifier. So this, although it doesn't look like it, is a perfect classifier for this data. Why is this a perfect classifier? Because the positive example is now close enough that it can manipulate and move to be classified as positive, whereas the negative example can't. So this is actually a perfect classifier for data that can move in a ball of radius 0.5 for this, this kind of data. So there was a perfect classifier, but we made an infinite number of mistakes, so that's bad. <laughs> Okay, so how can we fix that problem? So we can fix it by trying to make the algorithm strategy aware. So this we'll call the strategic perceptron. And I'm gonna give it in the special case of L2 manipulation and assume that we know that how far people can manipulate. So, so we're gonna assume that everyone can manipulate the same amount and we know what that is, okay? And you can, you can extend some of these. Okay, so everyone can move, say, some radius R. We'll assume there exists a perfect classifier if there wasn't manipulation. So here would be a perfect classifier if there wasn't manipulation. And so if we knew what that classifier was, there's an easy answer, which is you just shift it over by R units. If you just shift that over by R units, to make, okay, um, so this is, this is the formula for shifting it over by R units here, then that would work in the presence of manipulation because now everything to the left of the purple line can't move to the right of the blue line and everything to the right of the purple line can move to the right of the blue line. So this is actually now a perfect classifier if people can manipulate. Okay. Um, if you're familiar with the way the perceptron algorithm is analyzed, or even if you're not, what you need to do is every time you make a mistake, you gotta make progress somehow. And the way this algorithm makes progress is if you make a mistake on some example x, you gotta be able to find something, which could be x itself or something else, with the property that that thing is, uh, has a positive inner product with the true classifier w star, but a zero or negative inner product with the classifier you currently have w. If you can find that, you can update yourself and make progress. Okay, just take that on faith. All right. So let me just show you a little bit of the analysis because it turns out that, um, well, first of all, what is the algorithm? <laughs> the algorithm is we start in the usual way, predict negative, we see the first positive example, and we'll, we'll initialize um, to that. And we'll just shift that over by our units and use that blue line now as our or blue hyperplane in d-dimensional space as our decision boundary. Okay, now there's four cases to consider. Three of them are pretty trivial, and there's only one that's interesting. So let me just go through each of them really quick. So the first case is if we make a mistake, what happens if we make a mistake on a positive example to the left of the purple line? So some point like this. So that's actually an easy, a nice case. So this point, one thing we can do, we can just update using it directly. So it's the left of the purple line, so it satisfies this condition. And that point was not manipulated. What person in their right mind would manipulate, would move, and still get yourself classified negative? There's no reason. The lazy thing to do is just stay where you are. Okay, so that, that would be your utility maximizing thing to do. So that's still a positive example for the right answer, so we can just update using it directly. Great. Here's a harder case. What if there is a point between the purple and the blue line? So that doesn't satisfy this condition here. Luckily, this should never happen. Why? Well, if you're there, then you should have moved to the blue, to the right of the blue. It's distance less than R. You should have moved there, okay? And if you didn't start there, there's no reason to move there. No reason to put an effort and move somewhere and still get yourself classified negative. So that would have been the starting point. And if you started there, you would have moved to the blue line. So this should never happen. And if it does happen, that means that, that you have a bad estimate of how far people can move. And so you can actually, if you see that, and you didn't know the true amount people could move, you could use this in a binary search to find that. Okay, so this case, which would be bad, luckily can't happen under these assumptions. Great. Third case, what about a negative example that's strictly to the right of the blue line? Well, then this point shouldn't have been manipulated because why move farther than you had to? If you're gonna manipulate, you would move just right to the line. Why, why do extra effort if you're a utility maximizer? So not only, uh, so, this, so what that means is we can take that point reflect it through the origin. If we reflect it through the origin, 
we will now satisfy this, being to the left of the purple line, and we would uh, flip the upper inequality as well and, and actually be a true positive example here, and we can update using that. The one last case, and the one that actually we have to do something interesting, is what happens, we see a negative example, it's sitting there on that blue hyperplane, it probably might have manipulated from somewhere, what do we do? Well, here's what we can do. We'll take that example, reflect it back to the purple, let's push it back to the, the purple line, flip it through the origin, and update using that. Okay, why, why will we do that? So, so claim that this will actually satisfy the, the criteria we want. And the reason is, uh, because it's something I haven't told you, which is that um, our algorithm maintains inductively the fact that the inner product of, even if our current class of our vector w is not correct, it at least has a positive inner product with the correct answer, uh, w star. And that's maintained inductively. And that's important because where did that point start from? Well, it, it moved you know, or perpendicular to our hyperplane because it's a utility maximizer, somewhere between here and here, maybe some point in the middle. And we pushed it back maybe too far. We might have pushed it back farther than it really came from. But that's OK. We, subtract, we had a negative example here. And we pushed it back. And by pushing it back, subtracting more in the direction of w only means we're subtracting more in the direction of w star. So, so this point here is also negative. That's the key thing. That, that yellow dot was a negative example. That's where it really lived. We pushed it farther back. It's still negative. Reflect it through the origin. It's now a true positive. And so that satisfies this condition, which is the key point. And so that's what allows this algorithm to work. OK. And you can extend this to, to, to some other things. All right, um, good. So let me just mention very briefly just some, some, some further work on, 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 these, on these lines, um, and then I'll end. So one is uh, we've been looking at metric ball manipulations, but uh, more generally, you can analyze um, what happens in, in a, uh, a kind of a, a combinatorial setting where you can think of examples as nodes in some directed graph and edges just representing uh, what agents can do. So um, you have an agent here, they can look like they're here, they can look like they're there. You could just imagine creating a directed graph where the, uh, uh, the starting point is where the agent started and then the edges to what they can look like and, just, and look at learning in that kind of a setting, a, a directed graph-based setting, and then you can analyze the kind of things you can learn there. Um, you can also think of having, so everything I've been talking about here have been gaming actions. Agents are changing how they appear, but they're not changing their true qualification. You can imagine a world where agents have gaming actions and true improvement actions. So for instance, maybe, you know, maybe just opening up a bunch of credit cards doesn't change your true credit worthiness, but taking a course on money management, that might actually make you more credit worthy, more loan worthy. And so uh, you know, if that's a feature and you can change it, you actually might be making yourself positive. And one thing interesting there is that um, the natural goal of the classifier is not just to have low error, but actually to create more positives. So if you're a bank, you know, and you make money giving out loans to qualified people, sure, you want to correctly distinguish qualified and unqualified people, but if you don't got, give out any loans at all, you're not going to make any money. So you want to create, well, you need to create a market, maybe, right? So, so if, if, if you're in this kind of a world, then, then you're going to make more money if you can create more true positives. And so you want to incentivize people to actually become positive, become qualified, so you can give them a loan and, and make money. Um, and also, uh, in more uh, complex scenarios, all the scenarios I've talked about so far, it's very easy for agents to figure out what they should do. In, in more complex settings, it might be challenging for agents to figure out how they should behave. How should they manipulate? And you can consider the problem of designing manipulation helpers that will help agents compute their best responses. And so this is very similar to um, what Emma talked about yesterday morning about personalized uh, policies for people. You know, you'd like to tell people, here's what you should do. And you might wonder, well, why should a decision maker help people, you know, manipulate? Well, if, if you're a Stackelberg leader, you, you want, you're assuming people are going to best respond. If some people aren't best responding because they don't know how, that could maybe cause problems. And so, you know, there's fairness considerations. You want to put everyone on the level playing field. But also, from a decision maker's point of view, you're going to make better decisions if you can, you know, more clearly understand what everybody is doing. Um, 
You know, so so you, it, you know helps the decision maker to not lose qualified candidates who maybe just didn't know how to play the game. And so so I think that's an in, that's an interesting direction that we're currently thinking about, and, and there's other work on too. Okay, that's it. So I don't even know which side to ask a question on, but somehow your first side made the assumption that you're allowed to use a separate classifier for the two groups. That's often not legal. So what effect does any of what you're talking about have if that thing is not legal? And for the second part, sorry to ask actually two questions. Uh, in, if I think of disadvantaged groups, they usually don't have the same ability to move, which affects all of the stuff you talked about. Like if you could assume that one group is less able to move than the other group, that causes problems in, the, uh, in what you talked about, the second part. Great, great. So let me take the first one first. because So, so the, the setup I had at the beginning uh, allowed your classifier to do separate things on the two groups. And so, um, uh, so, you, so you know, one, one thing you might ask is maybe a way to fix that problem is just delete group membership from feature space. So the problem with that, so there's two problems. One is that once you get a big enough feature space, even if you can't ex explicitly doing some, something on the two groups, then because their distributions are different, you could still be doing something on the two groups. So, um, so it, it doesn't like fix that problem. So the only thing that we're assuming is that you can get Bayes optimal classifiers. Um, and, and actually, maybe to drill into that a little bit more, you could say, well, OK, what if we were in a situation where the two distributions were actually the same? What if the XY distributions and XY pairs were the same for the two groups? So in that case, in, I would say in that case, the kind of bias that we're looking at becomes less interesting because there is a trivial answer, which is only train on group A. OK, so imagine you only train on white males and use that for everybody. Why not? OK, well, one reason why not might be because they're not really the same distribution. So if you're in a world where that's a legal answer, that's a, not legal, that's a, a, a good answer, Great. So we're interested in cases where that's not a good answer. You really do want it because they, they do have different groups. And then you have to different distributions. And then you do have to worry that even if you, you know, can't explicitly see it, they are living in different parts of the space and your classifier may really need to do something different. So, so OK. But I think it's a, but that's a great, great point. Um, and then the second part, yeah, I think it's a really interesting thing. If you had different groups that could manipulate different amounts. The, the last point I, I was looking at is, is I mentioned it is um, kind of a similar issue where they could manipulate the same amount, just some have more knowledge and others have less knowledge. And so the idea is to try to give the, the knowledge of how to do it. But what if the actual abilities were different? I think that's a great direction. I don't have anything to say, <laughs> but I think it's a great direction. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, um, uh, does the assumption that the fairness conditions hold before bias mean the distribution is the same? So if the distribution is the same, that would happen. But there are other ways it could happen. They could just, um, just live in different parts of the space. So they just have to have the same local statistics, for example. But the, 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 you can just imagine, for instance, imagine group A is a Gaussian, you know, or centered here with a classifier. I guess then group B is a Gaussian centered over there. So they, they could be different marginals. And, uh, and you could even tilt, you know, have the axes different. Maybe just uh, for one, one group uh, feature, uh, the uh, X1 feature is more important than the X2 feature. For the other group, the X2 feature is more important than the X1. So you, you can make them, make them equally kind of good without making them the same. But we can talk offline too. 